Welcome to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. In this podcast, we will focus on successful marketing methods for advisors that generate prospects and clients. We will learn from the best in the industry on how advisors in the trenches today are growing their practices. Join us for this journey where Brad draws from years of expertise and guest experts to help advisors reach their full potential. This is the Be Advised Leading with Value podcast hosted by Brad Swinehart of White Glove. If you are new to the podcast, welcome. If you've listened before, it's awfully good to have you back. This promises to be an inspiring episode. Brad's guest is Dr. April Truppiano, an entrepreneur since the age of 20. Now, Dr. April has built several endeavors into healthy six- and seven-figure businesses. She's been in the financial services industry for three decades and holds registered professional licenses in some fields. A former TV and radio host, Dr. April is also an author and has been a featured expert in a range of publications, including Forbes, Huffington Post, and today's Innovative Woman. Uh, Brad, this is some heavy-duty guest here. Can you keep up? Well, <laughs> you know, April and I are probably better friends than uh, than most, and I think that she'll allow me a little bit of uh, leniency when it comes to this, just because we're such good friends that I've been able to kind of weasel my way into the the, <laughs> um, the podcast today. So, April, thank you very much for being on. Um, I would love to, before we kind of get into the meat of this, I'd love to hear more about what you have going on internationally and some of the programs that you've been a part of. Um, I'm happy that you're back in the States and able to chat with us today. But you know, for the, for the listeners, I'd love to hear more about what you have going on overseas and, and what some of those programs look like. It's always fun to be with you, my friend. It's always fun. So I would be, I'd be delighted. Listen, I'm so excited because you know, I, I love the fact that I get to work anywhere in the world. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, places that I, I love to travel, obviously right now I'm not traveling much at all. Um, but even just with the fact that, you know, we have digital access to the entire world. And, you know, at one point I thought that working specifically in our financial services industry would really stifle me. You know, I'd get stuck in one place, but truthfully, the whole entire world has financial services advice, you know, we have financial advisors, we have um, insurance agents, you know, all of that. So it gives me access to people that I can work with across the globe. And then on the flip side, it also allows me to be introduced to really interesting opportunities. And one of them that I'm very excited about, I hope you don't mind if I share something a, a little bit personal here, Brad, but uh, I just literally received a few days ago, my peace ambassador badge which is uh, affiliated with the United Nations. And I am an ambassador at large for the Economic and Social Council. But this is a new designation, the Peace Ambassador Badge. And uh, <laughs> the first question everyone always asks me is, does it give me diplomatic immunity? Which it actually does. <laughs> That's what I wanted to know. That was immediately what I wanted to know is what kind of hijinks can we get into? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I hope I never need to call on that diplomatic immunity, uh, but it does. But more importantly, what it does is opens doors for the people that I love to serve. You know, I, I love what I get to do in my business, and I do believe that I serve my clients. And in turn, I serve their clients. And more importantly to me, I, I serve their families as well, you know, making sure they go home to their families and love on them and, and take good care of them and plan for their futures. However, you know, there's a, a cause, for example, close to my heart, I sit on the board of advisors of an organization called 10 by three, and we are working to literally eradicate poverty and we are making great headway. We're literally patenting a process for what we do. It's a patented process. And um, what we do is we go into these countries where there is extreme poverty and we teach women in particular how to become artisans, how to have a trade, and then we pay them uh, prosperity wages, which is sometimes we'll pay them for a couple of weeks worth what they would have earned in six or 12 months getting wow. paid in their own home countries. And by having that peace ambassador badge and by having the ambassador at large status, 
What that does is it allows us to go into these areas where we're trying to make inroads and be able to come in and speak to the people. Because a lot of times you'll need permission from tribal kings, tribal leaders. You'll need permission from country leaders. And being able to open those doors is really important. And and having those credentials helps us do it. And frankly, sometimes it also, we need that so that we can have conversations with governmental leaders because Sometimes we find that local people are intimidating and basically shaken down our artisans and we have to go in and be willing to to do what it takes to make sure that they can be prosperous and that they can do business so that they can take care of not only themselves, but their families and their communities. We find that when they lift themselves out of poverty, they take their, they not only take care of their families, but they take care of their communities. That's why I get, I get a little moved by it. It, um, It's amazing to watch, you know, they, 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 they employ people in the community. They help build schools. They help build, you know, wells. It's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. The ripple effect. So I feel really honored to take on this ambassadorship, the peace ambassador appointment and and be able to put it to use to to just serve people who who need doors open to have a, a future. Well, congratulations. I mean, that sounds absolutely amazing. I have no idea how you even get started down that <laughs> path, uh, but it sounds just life changing for a lot of people. And to have that passion and to have that drive to go in and do those sorts of things, start those sorts of programs, come up with those ideas. I mean, a lot of that probably relates back to your passion for the financial services industry, you know, and and obviously a different capacity, but what is some of your background in the financial service industry and how does that passion relate to what your, you know, quote unquote, your day job? I mean, how does that relate? You know, uh, I I think the way that it, that it mostly relates is, as I said, I, I find that I feel like what I do, um, is servant leadership. Uh, I think that what I do is making sure that someone asked me this, I was traveling earlier this year, (laughs) I was traveling in another country and I was sitting next to a gentleman who did not uh, understand English. So, uh, but but we, we made our way through and um, um, I I speak the language, uh, his native language somewhat, but I, uh, he asked me, what is it you do? He said, you know, I saw you speak and I was amazed by what you said, and I love what you do, you know, and, but I don't know how you do it. Like, what is it you really do on a day-to-day basis? Like you said, Brad, kind of your day job. And I took a moment, and I think for the first time ever in all of my years of my career, I looked at him, and I, you know, what really fell out of my lip, out of my mouth was, I save marriages. I restore families. I, I restore health to people. And I know that may sound crazy, but when you come into working with a business owner whose business is struggling, there's strife. There's strife with their their relationships. There's strife with their families. There's uh, strife with their self-confidence. There's strife with their health. And when we put the business back in order, when we get the business in an order that it's actually a business and not just a job, you know, I always say we transform financial advisors and insurance agents from solopreneurs into CEOs so that they can play more, spend more time with family and still make money at the office. And that is not my shtick. That's that, those are the words that come out of my client's mouth because, um, you know, I have, I have spouses who send me thank you notes and, and call me and thank me and, and tell me, you know, my, my husband, my wife comes home and has dinner with the family. Thank you for helping them keep their promise to me because they come home and they have dinner with the family. I don't feel like a single parent anymore. Um, I see people who were, you know, ready for a heart attack because they were working too many hours and eating lousy food and eating at their desk and, you know, not getting time for exercise and all of that, you know? So I think it still comes back to, I'm a huge stand for family. And I know that um, this industry Everyone that I meet is a stand for family. It's why they do what they do, because they want to help families leave a legacy. And I have to look at them in the face and say, well, what is the legacy you're leaving? What's the legacy you're leaving? And so we work on that. You know, we work on that. Um, and, you know, Brad, I was in this industry. I was licensed in this industry. I, I did the work. And I got to be honest, I left because back then 
they wouldn't let me do what I needed to do in order to make sure I was with my family. And I tell people, you're in a golden moment. I know that we're dealing with a lot of stuff right now and it all looks topsy-turvy and it all looks like we don't know where it's gonna go. But if we look for the silver linings, one of them is the fact that now our industry finally understands what I have been preaching since I left it over a decade ago, which is that we need digital ecosystems. And I got to tell you, I said it just this morning to a client. I said, right now is the moment that I was waiting for back then when they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't allow me because of compliance reasons and their concerns and all that to create a digital ecosystem that I knew I would need with CRMs and my own website and data collection and all, and, you know, online apps and all this stuff so that I could go home to my family. And so I am, I am so excited actually for our industry right now. I really am. That might be my favorite thing about talking to you is you're always so excited. If I could bottle up that passion and sell it, I would retire <laughs> next week. So I love that. And you covered so many points here. So let me um, take a couple of steps back. And, and first, what you mentioned was helping advisors you know, kind of step outside of that business and be that CEO instead of that, you know, the jack of all trades wearing every single hat. And I think so often advisors get into this business to do exactly what you said, to help families. And then they realize, well, hey, I need to be a business owner. Oh, I need to be a, a marketer. Oh, I need to be a boss and a leader. And I need to know what a CRM is. And by the way, I need to do X, Y, and Z. And it has nothing to do with helping families. So they get so overwhelmed that either they bail out of the industry completely or like you said, they end up working 80 hours a week, never seeing their families. So that's so powerful. And I think that so many advisors need to really listen to your message. And it obviously goes very well with what White Glove offers, but to take a step back and not be the not be the person doing everything, but be the person that oversees and make sure that it gets done. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. And yes, that is the difference be between being a solopreneur, that jack of all trades and being a CEO, the person who drives the vision, the person who drives the strategic planning and, 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 and drives the key initiatives and drives all of those things, all those, those, those important trendy terms that we use in business development. You got to, you need to be the driver. You need to be the, the visionary. You need to be the leader. You need to be the delegator. You need to be the overseer, but you don't need to be the doer of all things. And, and by staying in that lane, you are doomed to exhaustion and burnout. And in some sense, failure, because you may make all the money, but lose the other things that are important to you, or you may honor the things that are important to you, which is a good thing, and never make the financial goals that you that you need to make in order to take care of the things that are important to you and the people that are important to you. And I remember back when I was in my early twenties, and I was a um, sales manager, and my my boss would ask a hundred things of me a day. And I was just running around like crazy when I first got into management, just doing absolutely everything that he asked. And he was doing it on purpose. He, and at, at one point he sat me down and he said, look, I know you want to get all this stuff done. I know you understand the importance of it, but if I ask you to do something and you have a whole team of people and you're the person that does it, then you're not doing your job. And right there, I kind of took a step back and thought, oh, you know what? That's the difference between running a business and being in the business. And your message is always so powerful of, hey, advisors, you know, focus on what you do best. Let other people focus on what they do best and, yeah. and analyze that data. But if you're running around doing everything, you're never going to see it. You're, you're too far in it to really make a successful business. And I love what you said about, you know, transitioning into virtual and having a digital environment. And yeah, this, this year really forced the industry to evolve, which in many aspects is absolutely amazing. That's easy to look back and, and look at the downsides of this year, but pushing forward from a tech standpoint, I think we grew 10 years that without this compliance would have never let us do. And that to me is absolutely, absolutely amazing. 
So what in your in your line of work, when you're talking to these advisors every day, what trends do you think are going to help drive business in 2021? Well, I think that what we, uh, first of all, I love what you said, Brad. I, I absolutely love what you said. And that's why I brought you on the show. So you could say what I say is good. I mean, that's, that's why you're exactly <laughs> there. You go. So I'm over here, like shaking my head and going, yes, 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 yes. Um, you know me, my arms are waving. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I, you know, I, I think that we saw several trends coming out of, of everything that happened this year and they're going to carry over. One of them is obviously that flight to omni-channel and digital omni-channel and digital. The piece that I think that a lot of companies are missing is they're still not giving their advisors enough tools and effective enough tools. So, so that's an area that I want to come back to in a minute, but uh, that is definitely something that I've been fighting for, for over a decade. Like you said, um, it's been more than a decade. I've been fighting for that for our, for our, um, our advisors and agents. Um, the other trend that we're seeing is that there is a, uh, there's definitely a switch to a home body economy. People, I don't know if you want to call it their, I don't know if you call it nesting. I don't know if you want to call it lazy. I don't know if you want to call it, uh, you know, cautious, whatever it is, people are getting used to homebody. You know, I'm going to speak for myself. I have, you know, I mentioned this in the beginning, but I've been digital for, for two decades at least, right? And, but I've even gotten a little lazy, right? I'm going, hey, why? Do I have to fix my hair and put on makeup? I went digital, so I wouldn't have to fix my hair and put on makeup. And now everybody wants to be on a video call, so I have to fix my hair and put on makeup, you know? But it's the kind of the same thing when it comes to like getting out, getting in the car, going out. Now, some people need that to, to you know, feel invigorated. Some people are saying, I really, I, I kind of like the fact that I don't have to do that unless I want to do that. So we got to be conscious of that and, and make... A um, you know, have, have consideration for that. Um, the other one is a caring economy. People want to know that you care. So that EI, that emotional intelligence, that empathy, that is critical. But not only knowing it and not only talking about it, but building your business around letting people know that you're there. I'm going to tell you something. When all this stuff first started happening, I reached out to my clients who, by the way, I am proud to say, and this is a huge pat on the back to them, every single one of them, by, by you know, looking at these facts alone, these trends that we saw, we, we, they have grown they, they uh, did better than they forecasted from last year to this year, their year over year forecast, they, they superseded it in the middle of a pandemic and a lot of it working from a remote location. So by looking at these things, these are critical. This is not just feel good stuff. This is that you got to reach out. You got to let people know that you're there. You got to look at, you know, what are your client services? What are your plans and your strategic initiatives around client services? And um, the other trend that I see is that trust and security are key concerns for investors. 70% still say that quality of service is their number one criteria. So again, you know, reaching out, letting them know, looking at what are my client services initiatives? What are my client services strategies? How am I servicing those, those you know, especially those top clients? Um, and quality of life is a number one emerging concern for advisors. I had one client say to me, Brad, I never realized, even though you've been saying it, I never realized how much I missed being home with my kids because they're going to be going off to college soon. And I don't want to miss this. So much packed into that one um, answer there. So let's deconstruct that a little bit. Uh, one thing I want to focus on is you talked about emotional intelligence and you talked about reaching out digitally in various forms. And I think in 2021, more than ever before, and we talk about a, a lot at White Glove, is the idea behind captive marketing. And what that really is, is having such credibility such connection and an emotional intelligence, like you said, and then being available to all of your clients and prospects and your, your community in such a way that that's your, if you think about it, that's your captive audience. They, if you can increase your credibility and your available, um, your availability, then you can inspire them to take action, to work with you, to reach out to you, to talk to you, to stay in connection with you 
using that idea of captive marketing of those, those people in your inner circle, increasing your credibility, but it has to be, you know, like you said, omni-channel, you have to be out, you know, advisors, if they don't have a, a professional LinkedIn page right now, they're missing the boat. You know, 10 years ago, we realized that you had to have a website, right? You have to have a website. <laughs> and right now that same thing as social media, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, you have to have a professional, friendly, and real presence on those platforms. I read a stat the other day that said 70% of potential prospects and investors will research a professional on LinkedIn before they decide to do business with or reach out to that person. 70%. So if you aren't into social media, like many advisors aren't because compliance said you can't for so many years, you're missing that opportunity to have that emotional connection, like you mentioned, and that ability to really market to your captive audience. You know, you, you couldn't be more correct. And this is where I say that compliance needs to understand. And I, and compliance, look, I tell people compliance can be your friend. Don't make them your enemy make them your friends so that they work with you and not, you know, you don't feel like they're constantly coming up against you because they're just doing what they need to do to protect everyone, including you and your clients. And, and yet I say that this is where, this is where I refer to where st we still have to do some work on the advisor facing side because everybody's out there and, and they've been in the last few years, they've been patting themselves on the back because they started working on the client facing side. Oh, we'll make sure that clients can find us. They can get an online quote. They can get an online this and an online that. Great. Well, what are you doing to make the advisor's life more, you know, more fluid and more streamlined and more workable? What are you doing for them? You know, I go on and, and what you said about your, your LinkedIn profile, it has to say something that's personal, but a lot of companies are stymieing people. They're stifling them so much that all they can put on there is their disclaimer and a photo and the company name. It's insanity because we all know, I just said it, they want to know you care. They want to know who you are. They want to know they can trust you. They're worried about trust and security and, 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 and you know, who are you and do you relate to me? Do you know what's going on for me? And how are you going to do that if you can't even talk about who you are and, and your brand strategy or your brand, um, your brand story, right? And so, you know, uh, it's that third person, they force them to put those, those nasty third person BS uh, profiles, you know, that they're these, it's like, it tells you all my credentials. Yes, I, I need to know it's your credentials. Cookie cutter with a disclosure on it, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for getting me off my soapbox. Yes. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, like we gotta, we gotta be able to help them. We gotta be able to help them with all the tools they need and give them the latitude. They give them this, you know, website that doesn't say anything about who they are. Doesn't say anything about who they are. Maybe one line about where they live and whether or not they have children. I mean, I want to know about you. I, I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know why, why are you a better person than, you know, Susie Q down the street or, or Billy Joe down the street who tells me he can get me a better rate. Because, yeah, price is important. But you know what? I know because I am that person. I'm that client that says I'll pay more if you take better care of me. If you take really good care of me, I'm not going to complain about the fact that I'm paying you 10, 15 percent more. I'm not. And it's interesting too, because prospects and clients are spending more and more time on social media. So the environment has totally changed. And you always have, you know, I think Luke said it in one of my previous podcasts, you have one ability or one chance to wow a prospect or a client, and that's giving them information before they know to search for it. And mm -hmm. if you can be prevalent and have a presence on social media and showcase that you're a human being and then push data and push information to your current clients and prospects. I mean, that's what they need because anyone can learn information, right? You can pick up your cell phone and find out any stats that you want and your prospects and clients are absolutely doing that. And if they're not getting it from you, they're getting it from somewhere. And who do you want them to get answers from if it's not from you? I mean, and that's what I always ask advisors when they're, when they're talking to, uh, you know what, I'm not interested in social media. I said, okay, well, when your clients are on social media, who do you want them to see if you're not willing to be on social media? Who, would, who do you want them to be talking to? 
And that's just something that the whole industry has to evolve and realize that every other industry has adapted to this years and years ago. And the financial services industry is just now waking up to the fact that, oh, I have a website. Well, that doesn't cut it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I'll tell you, um, this goes back to something that we've talked about before and, um, and I talk about all the time, which is you also have to really have a lot of, uh, you have to have a lot of inside knowledge of who your client is, who your ideal client is. Because if you think your ideal client is everyone, then, then you're talking to nobody when you're trying to talk to everyone. We know this, right? But it, it comes, it's more than just knowing, okay, so I, you know, I have my CDFA, so I only want to work with divorced women or whatever that is, right? Uh, it's more than that. It's what I call the empathy profile. And you've got to know who that ideal client is, not only by a demographic, but by a behavioral graphic and a psychographic. Where do they go? Where are they? What are they thinking? What are they seeing? What are they doing? What are they hearing? All of those aspects so that when you're talking to them, you know that you're speaking to their pain points directly. You know that you're speaking their language the way they would say it, not the way we would say it. Because the worst thing that, that I have heard over the years is when, is when smart people try to sound really smart when they're trying to sell people something. <laughs> It's the worst thing you could do, right? You got to speak people's language, use their words, don't use fancy schmancy industry terms. Um, but I digress there. You know, it's just, it's, it's talking to them in their own language and speaking to the pains they have and speaking to the aspirations they have. And you can only do that when you really know who they are. When you really look at that empathy profile and you create that, that client profile that says, this is who he or she or they are. Totally agree. I love these podcasts because you and I just agree with each other and think we're the smartest <laughs> people on here. And I, <laughs> that's always, that's always a lot of fun. So let's, let's focus on some real solutions then. What would you say are some concrete ways that advisors or agents can prepare for these changes, prepare for impacts, you know, moving into 2021, what can they do? What's something strategic that we can um, help advisors with today? Yeah. Well, one of the things I want to preface it all with, Brad, is that, you know, everything that I that comes out of my mouth right now, I know, you know, we always need to revisit it in the next 30, 60, 90 days. Um, you know, all of my business planning in the past has been for the next 12 months and then the next 18 months and then I guess 24 months and 36 months. Right now, we're looking at 90 day plans. So everything's going to be fluid and you got to be willing to know that it will be fluid. However, that said, uh, I think that people really right now, we need to look at what are our key initiatives, really break down that 90 day plan and say, what do we want to make sure that we get done in the first 90 days, the second 90 days, you know, quarter by quarter. And some of those key initiatives, I'll tell you that I'm really pushing with my clients and, and we're really, um, that we're really looking at are, how are you going to perfect your CRM, your data integrity, and your data collection. If you're not getting the right data, and if your data is not clean, and you're not nurturing that data, then it's all useless. Then you're pounding the pavement every day, which by the way, you can't even pound the pavement. You got to find other ways to do that. So you got to make sure that your, that your data is good, that your CRM is clean, and that you have definite processes inside of your CRM, your customer relationship or client relationship management system, that you have processes and workflows set up so that things can happen you know, automatically. It moves to the next phase, the next phase. Um, the next part of it is that you've got to have a key initiative around nurturing your top clients. You know, not just so that you can increase AUM or, or, or sell them something else, which is a good thing, but also because one of the areas that advisors and agents I find are really uh, weak is asking for referrals. Now, they may, you know, ask for them here and there, uh, but they don't have a good system for that follow up. And I'm telling you, I literally have a client who, like I said, when we first started with this whole debacle of the year, we were just reaching out and we were making sure people knew we cared and just telling people, what do you, you know, what do you need? What do you need? Asking, what do you need? How can I serve you? How can I serve you? And it was the, it was, it was the best thing they could have done because their business grew 
so much by referrals that they had to hire a new advisor and a new staff person just by reaching out and nurturing that top 20%. Now, it doesn't mean you let go of the 80%, but really looking at how are you segmenting. Again, I'm getting back to, I don't want to get into the weeds of it, but, you know, segmenting it down and saying, you know, what do they need? What does this group need from me? What does this group need from me? How can I serve them? And reaching out and asking so that you can fill in the blanks on that empathy profile. You know what they need to hear and what they need to see. I think it's also another key initiative, Brad, is that this is the time that we need to be really looking at our business model. Uh, again, I don't want to get into the weeds of it, but I have been a huge proponent for fee-based planning for a long time. It's another thing that I jumped up and down and said, hallelujah, when other people were, you know, freaking out about it. And I said, this is the best thing that could ever happen. Um, even, you know, some of my clients were also moving to, um, you know, recurring monthly revenue models and they are compliant and we're seeing them more and more. And it is increasing some of what you said, Brad, is increasing that opportunity to keep their attention, to give them the information and the knowledge and, and, and you know, parts and pieces that they need as our clients and to keep them in our pipeline so that, you know, maybe they're a newer investor or maybe they're not in the high net worth, but, you know, they're, they're inching closer. And as we move them up our you know, up our, what I call our profit pyramid. And that is, you know, how, how much time and attention we can afford to give them as we um, move them up to the top 20% of our clientele. It keeps them, it keeps them in touch with us. It keeps us in front of them, but not just as that, that freebie hanger honor. I mean, if people are going to think I'm so mercenary when I say this, but there's just a different <laughs> mind. It's terrible. But, you know, there's not, that's a technical term, freebie hanger honor. You know, nobody very pays technical, attention. Very technical. Yeah. Yes. I think I have that label in yes. my CRM right now. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, but, you know, they're, uh, most times they're, they're ignoring that newsletter. But when someone becomes a client, whatever level at which they become a client, they're listening to you. Now they're saying, you know, the advice you're giving me, the information you're giving me is important and I'm going to pay attention to it. So again, revamping that business model, looking at, you know, if you're not doing fee-based, um, which a lot of people are now, but, but, but even looking at and go, what does that fee-based level look like? How am I selling the value and how am I providing the value versus the commodity? I work a lot with people, Brad, to get them away from the commodity mindset and get away from offering commodity-based offerings, right? We got to be on that value-based offering. So if you haven't done it, if you've been resisting it, if you've been kind of dipping your baby toe in it, that is a key initiative you need to be looking at. So again, these are the things that I'm, I'm telling my clients about is on these key initiatives is really looking at your data collection, your data integrity, and, uh, and looking at how you're managing that CRM, that process for nurturing those clients, really paying a top, uh, paying attention to your top 20 client percent of your clients. And then looking at, um, how are you going to reach new clients? I didn't even mention that, but that comes in secondary there with that, with that process of, you know, keeping your pipeline full because we're doing it in a different way than we used to do it. And I love what you guys are doing. And I admire the fact, although it did not shock me because you guys are brilliant over there, that you moved so quickly into uh, the digital world with, with your uh, seminars and workshops and showing people that you can still fill the room. It's just a virtual room and you can still meet with people even though it's meeting with them virtually. Um, so, you know, finding strategies to keep filling that pipeline and moving people up the, um, up the, up the pipeline in your, uh, in your CRM. And then the last thing is looking at your business model and looking at how you can increase the value if you're already doing fee-based or how you can increase uh, your offerings to offer more value to your clients. I love that. I ask one question and I get 12 solid answers. <laughs> one and if thing we didn't tell people to grab a pen and paper, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> you know, I tell people I'm an edutainer. I can talk all day and we can, you know, uh, shoot the breeze, but I always like to give at least a little something you can take away because we're all looking for how to make it not only to survive, but to thrive. And, you know, this is, like I said, this is the moment that I was waiting for when I was in your shoes, and I'm speaking to our listeners, this is the moment I was waiting for, seize it, take advantage of it, you know, use people like Brad and, and his team at White Glove, talk to the people who understand 
and have their feet on both sides of the of the fence, right? One foot in the digital business world and one foot in the financial services industry to, so that we can marry those two. That was absolutely perfect. If you had one final thing, just that people need to take away from this episode today, one thing that they need to focus on, what would that be for 2021? And then we'll wrap it up. You know, if I had to say one thing, it would be, don't neglect yourself. We've seen so much um, going on with people's, I'm going to call it leadership health, as well as their own personal health. And now more than ever, people are, they really need to equip themselves to be resilient, to be agile, and to be empathetic, and to really take care of their own emotional and physical wellness. So, you know, in all this, you know, I'm using air quotes here because everybody keeps using the term in all this pivoting in all of this redefining and all of this uh, recreating and redesigning that we're doing, which is all good stuff. Don't neglect yourself. Don't neglect getting what you need so that you can be that that best CEO so that you can be that most effective CEO, but that you can also be that best version of yourself to take home to your family. That's a perfect note to end on. And I think that encapsulates your entire program and your entire mentality. So thank you very much for being on today. Powerful stuff. I'm going to go back and re-listen to all of this so I can take better notes. And I'm sure I can pick up a dozen wonderful gems out of today's episode. Brad and Dr. April, that was inspiring, it was insightful, and goodness knows it was energetic. Brad Swinehart of White Glove with Dr. April Trupiano, who helps financial advisors become relatable human beings. To know when more of Brad's Be Advised, Leading with Value podcasts are available, subscribe to this podcast with a subscribe button on this page, and of course you can share with friends and colleagues. Use the share button. Thank you for listening to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Mike Love. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.